Tim Cook says the time. I guess I better get started. <laughs> Anyways, good evening and thanks for coming, everybody. Um, you know, I've been coming to these shows for more than a decade, and and I've learned over the over that time period the worst thing to do or, or the rule number one is just don't insult your audience. And you know, I, I'm not worried about that here because I think hopefully that everybody in this room is not amongst the uh, investors that I'm referring to in the title of my presentation. Um, but if that is the case, I can hopefully change your minds and get you on the right path by 6:45 sharp. Um, we'll see. Before I dive in, I just want to take a minute to introduce myself to those of you who, who may not be familiar with what I do or what Weiss Ratings does, um, but my name is Mike Larson and I'm a senior analyst at the ratings firm in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Um, you may be familiar with the old Safe Money Report that we used to publish and in fact we've actually uh, brought that name back in uh, in-house and uh, that's what I've rebranded my high yield investing newsletter as, as of this month. Um, I'm also the editor of our Under the Radar Stocks newsletter. I've done quite a few special reports on a number of different topics and uh, white papers we've submitted to the government. And, I, and I'd like to think I'm also a highly successful blackjack player, at least that's what I'm gonna, gonna tell my wife when I get home, we'll see. Might have to fudge the truth a little bit, but. <laughs> and anyways, um, I do wanna kind of start, I mean, the goal of this presentation is to give sort of an overview of what I think is going on with the market. So I, I do wanna make one thing pretty much 100% crystal clear up front. and. I am probably more bearish now than I've been in quite some time after a long stretch of being bullish. I, I do tend to think that it's likely we're getting very close to what will probably turn out to be the third great bear market of this new millennium. And you know, you look at the blow off high that we had in January, it may not have been the top uh, for every market or every stock out there or um, what have you, but there were a lot of characteristics of that and, and what happened in February that, that does make me much more conservative than I've been in some time. And that tells me that I think that this long bull run is coming to, uh, coming to a close pretty soon. And if I want to answer the primary reasons why that is, I mean, I think number one, this extremely favorable and depending on how you want to look at it, arguably artificial market environment that we've had um, that lasted from March 2009 through January of 18 is changing rapidly. I think you're seeing monetary and fiscal policies that are increasingly diverging here and abroad as opposed to this sort of let we're all in this together, we're all pulling in the same direction environment of global cooperation and coordination that we previously had. And another thing that I'm, I'm seeing for the first time or I've been seeing for the first time in the last few months is, is some of these relatively obscure crisis indicators, I like to call them, that are flashing yellow and, and in some cases red. Uh, and it's something that I haven't seen and we haven't really seen since the days before the, uh, the start of the housing mess back in the mid 2000s. So um, those are some of the, the big picture thoughts that I'd share. And despite all that, you see a lot of, of pundits and TV anchors that are still kind of uh, talking like this and uh, like Kevin Bacon back in the day. I mean, I don't know, he looks a lot older these days. This was a few degrees of separation before. Um, but I think that the tone and the comments about the market are generally very sanguine, whereas I think uh, an approach of caution, an approach of worry uh, and, and taking protective action is much more likely now. Or if I guess I had to sum it up, Frankly, uh, I think you know my advice. If 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 you're following the pre-2018 market playbook, you're you're kind of doing it wrong. Like this guy here, you know, looking to put his boat in the water. Um, it is it's not the same market environment that we had over the last several years. So uh, one thing to keep in mind. Now, as I mentioned, and as you saw, the the goal of this is to talk about some of the critical mistakes that I think investors are making, and you know how I hopefully can get you guys to to think about things differently and take a different path. And if I look at the four main things I would summarize, it would start with the mentality that this QE forever backdrop is gonna persist, despite what I believe are huge philosophical and actual practical shifts we're starting to see from central banks, not just the Fed, but also central banks overseas. Um, I think that investors are, are obsessing over wildly overhyped tech stocks, and at the same time, ignoring deterioration in several other sectors. And I think some of that is frankly media driven. I mean, you, you can't uh, turn on the TV without hearing about the latest FANG development while the 9,000 some odd other stocks, whatever they're doing, doesn't get any news. Um, I think third, there is you know a little too much focus on peripheral markets, things that hey may have their um, you know may have their uses, may have their their benefits for investors who can focus on them, whether it's Bitcoin, cannabis, and so on. But what I think is most important going forward is what's happening in things that develop the overall mar or determine the overall market direction, which would be credit markets, currencies, and the like. <laughs> 
And lastly, uh, you know, we have a different political environment than we've had in this country in a number of years, and it's easy to get wrapped up in, in sort of the political noise and scandals that, that make for a lot of great TV and get a lot of headlines, but that ultimately don't impact markets. So we can all be passionate about politics and have our views, but it's important, or I think investors are making a lot of mistakes by getting too wrapped up in what's going on on the political front. Um, and, and as a result of all of these uh, these factors combined, these mistakes, I think that Many investors are missing what I frankly consider to be the biggest market story of this new millennium. And that's really the popping of what I call the everything bubble. Now, a few examples of this that I'll, you know, illustrations here of, of what I mean are in the, on this slide. And I'll talk, talk you through exactly where I see this manifesting itself and why I call it that. But I think before I do that, you know, we kind of have to talk about how we got here, right? And, you know, many people understand that interest rates have been cut and central banks have been active, but I think uh, you know a lot of investors don't realize the magnitude of what we're talking about here. I mean, we have major central banks in the U.S., obviously, but also the ECB, Japan, the U.K., China, and even smaller countries like Sweden and Switzerland that embarked on unprecedented, unprecedented asset buying and quantitative easing, such to the point that we have collective central bank balance sheets that have swelled to more than $20 trillion, or four times the pre-crisis levels we had back in, in early 2008. And, you know, there was a great study by Bloomberg several months ago that looked at the, the total worldwide number of interest rate cuts, uh, and, and it totaled to about 667 in the post-crisis period. Again, that's major central banks, minor central banks, and so on. Truly unprecedented intervention. I mean, in all of history, and, and this, is, this is a graphical, this is what the Fed's balance sheet has done, and this, this chart goes all the way back to 1959. I mean, in all of history, the Fed never even came close to printing as much money as it did in the post-crisis period. Uh, it's interesting. You can see a little tiny blip up there that was from Y2K, uh, another little tiny blip that was right after the September 11th attacks. But obviously, what was considered huge monetary intervention then to smooth things out was nothing like what we've seen in the last several years. And in all of history, the Fed never kept interest rates this low for this long. This chart goes back to the beginning of the 1970s, and that sort of period of low interest rates, uh, near zero interest rates, persisted for more than eight years, which is something we've never ever seen in the history of monetary policy. Uh, well, this is the modern Fed era. I should specify, you know, in the post era, they did have the what, what the Operation Twist or whatever the old original Operation Twist that they had, but this would be in, in modern Fed times. So if you look at that, you combine those two, and you look at what's happening overseas, this is the kind of result that you have. This is the buildup in global central bank balance sheet assets. Um, different colors represent different central banks. We have the Swiss National Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, the European Central Bank, and the US Fed. On the left-hand scale, you have it in dollars, trillions of dollars, and on the right, you have as a percentage of, of global GDP added up. And you can see this is truly staggering. Um, and even though the Fed has leveled off the, the dark blue or purple color there, um, everybody else has kind of picked up the slack and really shifted into high gear, particularly in Japan. So what's the cumulative impact of that? What, what kind of impact has that had on the markets? And I think what it has done um, is destroyed, to some degree, the rational, traditional way of valuing assets. And I would frankly say it ignited one of the biggest speculative orgies the world's ever seen. Um, you know, we've lived through this a couple of times, but unlike the 19, late 1990s, when you had a bubble that was largely contained to dot-com tech stocks, or even the early 2000s, when it was broader but still concentrated in housing and mortgages, I believe, based on the research I've done, that this bubble has infiltrated virtually every market in every place. I mean, when you look at the numbers and you look at the figures that I'm going to show you, it's stocks of all types, it's bonds of all kinds, it's commercial real estate, it's modern art, old world masterpieces, baseball cards, Bitcoin, and what I like to call the billionaire's row condos in, in central uh, Manhattan. Um, the list of, of examples of how this has manifested itself truly does go on and on in a way that what happened in the mid-2000s or the late 1990s did not. Now, obviously, one of the most important sectors that we, in our asset class we, we should talk about, because that's probably what you're most concerned about, is stocks. And this chart shows that stocks are, are almost, I like to call it, the most expensive by one key measure. And that key measure is something called the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio, or Schiller P.E., 
If you ever heard of Robert Schiller, he's a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist who had a lot to say about housing and the coming bust there and so on. But his theory behind this CAPE uh, ratio is that it helps smooth out some of the business cycle impacts on earnings growth and gives you a, a longer term, more, um, more better perspective on you know, price to earnings ratios. And by his measure, the, the S&P is running with a CAPE ratio of about 32 right now. Um, not only is that almost double the long term average of 16.8, it's also higher than it was in 1929, right before the stock market crash and Great Depression. And the only thing that really outpaces that is what we saw at the peak of the dot-com bubble. So that, by that one measure, by his measure, you would say stocks are almost the most expensive. Now, this is a chart that I think is much more telling, and it looks at the valuation of, of stocks or equities overall in a much broader perspective, not just the normal P.E. ratio, which a lot of people on TV will say, eh, you know, it's 18, 19, it's come down a little since the start of the year, what's the big worry? Um, well, adjusted P.E.s are much higher, but this looks at the market cap of the Wilshire 5000 index, the broadest index of, of U.S. stocks, and compares it to GDP. I think it's a fair comparison. I mean, you know, you would, GDP as it grows, uh, earnings go up, revenue goes up, stock prices go up. There's generally some kind of relationship there, and you know that's what we you have grown to expect for many, many, many years. But you can see, you know, we got way out of whack in what at the time seemed like the biggest stock market bubble ever, the dot com bubble that we had in you know the late 1990s. Um, then you can see that since the housing bubble was more focused on real estate than it was on stocks, while stocks uh, you know, gained uh, or were sort of out of whack with GDP, it wasn't as, as serious as in the dot-com. But what you have now is a ratio of about 1.7 um, you know, in terms of the, the Wilshire 5000 market cap to GDP, which clearly is worse than or more overvalued than anything we've ever seen in the history of this, uh, this particular way of tracking. So again, it's a different way of looking at things than PE, but it does tend to show asset valuations really are, are, are not making sense when you look at you know, the underlying performance of the US economy. And in sort of support of this everything bubble thesis, the important point is it's not just stocks. Um, this shows the Case Shiller National Home Price Index, one of the, you know, and it goes back to the very late 1990s. Um, you can clearly see the run up in house prices that we had, the surge as part of the housing bubble, and then the bust that followed. But now, house prices, residential real estate has also taken out finally the bubble era highs on a nationwide basis, that is. Um, residential, it's interesting, but I think you know the worst of that we saw previous time around. The problem is it's not just residential real estate. Here is a chart of uh, the Green Street Commercial Property Price Index, which looks at what's happening in, in commercial real estate, or CRE. Um, it's indexed to 100 at the peak of the last bubble, which everybody pretty much agrees was, at the time, the biggest real estate bubble in history. Um, we are now about 25% over the peak prices for nationwide commercial real estate values than we had at the peak of, again, what was considered to be the biggest real estate bubble in history. Now, when you combine what's going on with stocks, and real estate, you sort of look for an all-encompassing uh, measure of the value of those assets. And I think household net worth is a good way of doing so because it incorporates all assets on a household balance sheet. Um, well, this chart here compares household net worth as a percentage of disposable personal income. Obviously, what do we do to you know make money to buy stocks, buy real estate? I mean, the money comes from our income. So there should be some kind of relationship. Um, but what we've seen repeatedly as a result of, of what's been happening with monetary policy uh, is this you know, surge to almost 625% of dis disposable personal income at the peak of the dot-com bubble, which was followed by a bust. A surge in housing, driven obviously more by the real estate side than equities, to about 650% um, of disposable personal income, <laughs> to now over 675%. This repeated pattern that has been getting bigger each time, um, you know, at this point, asset values have never been more inflated than they are relative to income. And one last thing, we'll just be comparing um, household net worth to GDP. So before we looked at just the stock market side of things, this looks at the entire household balance sheet net worth. Um, you can see, again, same, it tells the same story. Um, you know, the dot-com bubble peak was smaller than the household bubble peak, but both pale in comparison to what I sort of dick, or nicknamed the everything bubble. All right, so what happens when you have uh, a situation like this where assets of all kinds are overvalued um, and there's so much easy money coursing through the system? Well, unfortunately, it, it's not just a bubble in terms of prices. It's a bubble in terms of stupid investor behavior and stupid financial behavior by, uh, by banks and so on. For example, this is a chart that goes back to 1980 that looks at the percentages of companies that were IPOing um, that had negative earnings. In other words, that were losing money at the time of their IPOs.
Um, something obviously stands out in the middle of the uh, chart. That's the peak of the dot-com bubble where 70 to 80% of companies going public weren't earning a penny at the time they did their IPO. Um, I'd like to think we learned something, but apparently not because we are now almost exactly back there as of 2017 in terms of companies going out there. Don't mind the thunder. Uh, in terms of companies going out there that are losing money at the time of IPOs. So again, I, I kind of characterize it as garbage companies being able to raise buckets of money again. Now, another side effect of what's happened is that companies have been encouraged and have been incentivized to lever up massively. I mean, borrow like never before. This chart shows corporate debt outstanding uh, and it's a trillion dollar scale on the left. So you can see even after we're coming out of the dot-com bust in the early 2000s, it wasn't really corporations that were taking on too much debt. It was individuals, mortgages, and so on. So even though that number was increasing, it was not increasing very quickly. We were at about $3 trillion at the peak of the last credit bubble in 06. Um, but since then, it's been absolutely astonishing how much debt companies have taken on. We've essentially doubled the value of corporate debt to more than $6 trillion as of last year. And you can see, again, even though there was an economic recovery um, fed by housing in a, in a bull market in stocks, Corporations were borrowing more, but it wasn't anything notable, whereas now it's pretty much gone vertical. And why are they doing Let's talk. Okay, so why are comp what, what are companies doing with this money? Why are they borrowing so much? Well, I'd love to say that it's all going into productive investment, R&D, building factories, hiring workers, and so on, um, but a lot of that money has been recycled, that borrowed money has been recycled into stock buybacks, M&A, other things that, um, you know, they do make investors richer, uh, they do make, certainly make CEOs richer, but what are they doing for sort of the productive uh, base or, or potential of the economy? Not much. And the problem is that there's so much cheap money, it's really leading to absurd valuations on a number of scales. For example, this chart looks at the average EBITDA purchase price multiple for LBO transactions. Uh, in English, what it shows is the multiple to core cash flow generation of companies that uh, private equity buyers are, buyers are paying. Um, they're now paying 11.2 times EBITDA when they buy, take over these companies, which is far and away the highest multiple we've ever seen in comparison to about 7.7 .7 at the you know the, in the middle of the great financial crisis. So. Again, uh, it's not just individuals or, and companies that are paying uh, through the nose of their stocks. Transaction multiples are now um, are now astronomical, and the problem with that is if you're trying to you know earn your bonus by uh, closing a few transactions, the, the problem is you've got to make the numbers look better if they don't really make a lot of sense. So, what's happening now is to make a lot of these deals pencil out. We're seeing number fudging at record rates. Specifically, this chart shows the percentage of deals that had so-called EBITDA adjustments as part of the transaction. Um, you know, you're probably all familiar with pro forma earnings where you say, oh, well, this was a one-time restructuring charge, so let's throw it out. Uh, the problem is you're seeing it in these deals now where 27 odd percent, 26, 27 percent of these deals are having to make those adjustments just to make the numbers look better to close these deals. Um, at the peak of the last credit bubble in the mid 2000s, that was about 15 percent. At the depths of the crisis, it was about 5 percent. So uh, it tells you that not only is there way too much borrowing to pay highly inflated um, prices for these transactions, you're also having to fudge the numbers to make it uh, work out. So you add it all up and you've got corporate debt, um, again, just like consumers were overburdened with mortgage debt heading into the last uh, bust, we have corporate debt that's now at its highest level ever relative to GDP. And this chart, again, goes back to the late 1950s. You've got these sort of peaks and valleys at the peak of the savings and loan bubble, which resulted in the massive uh, problems in the banking sector back then in the late 80s and early 90s, the dot-com bubble after it, the housing bubble after that, and this chart happens to call it the central bankers bubble, but it's the same general the uh, theme. We now have, again, a new record in corporate debt relative to GDP. One other problem that we're seeing um, in terms of all this borrowing um, is that the, the debt that's out there is of a junkier variety than ever before. Now, what this particular chart shows is the Covenant Light share of outstanding leveraged loans. Um, if you know, if you aren't familiar, Covenant Light is a nice way of saying that the bond buyers are giving the, the bond or the bond buyers are giving the corporate sellers pretty much everything they want to close. A, or you know, they're saying we have so much easy money laying out there, we need to get yield, so we're going to let you get away with a lot of stuff and still buy your bonds. Um, there's not as many restrictions on what the borrowing company can do. There are other things that they don't have to report as often. There's a lot of ways a loan can qualify as covenant light. 
but basically it means there's a lot less protection for the bond buyers. And the share of outstanding leveraged loans that have that are of this style are now up to 75%, which is an all-time record. I mean, we were talking about 60% as recently as 15. So in other words, a lot of junky lending going on. But what's even worse is there is a ton of junky lending to junky borrowers. This shows the total amount outstanding of covenant light loans in terms of to single B borrowers. You know, we're not talking about AAA, AA kind of quality borrowers. We're talking about those who, whose credit ratings are a lot lower. There was only about $50 billion of this paper outstanding back in 2010. It's now a multiple of that, about eight times more at $400 billion. So again, junkier lending to junkier companies, and that's not a recipe for success. <laughs> And one other thing I would add is that it's not even just junk companies that have uh, been borrowing like Matt, it's what you would call junk countries. Um, this chart, go again, goes all the way back to the mid-1990s. It shows sovereign bond issuance by companies that are, excuse me, by countries that are rated uh, junk, high yield. Um, they, you know, are below investment grade. And you can see that in 2017, the, the dollar value of these kinds of deals went off the charts. I mean, around 70 some odd trillion, or excuse me, billion dollars for 2017, up from about 55 the previous year. And even at the peak of the last credit bubble, you're looking at about 30 billion. So um, again, junk companies, junk countries getting into the mix. And these are, these are some of your lower rated emerging market countries, but also so-called frontier nations, Bolivia, um, you know, Mongolia, Vietnam, some of those types of countries are, are the ones who have been borrowing a lot. And in those countries, in the emerging market world, we're also seeing emerging market companies. Those earlier charts were talking about US corporate debt. Well, this chart shows emerging, mar emerging market company debt. And you can see, same story. This has absolutely ballooned in the last several years to the point that emerging market companies now own about $2.8 trillion in US dollar denominated debt. That's double the level we saw before the great financial crisis. And the interesting thing about when you're borrowing in emerging markets, you can borrow in the local currency or you can borrow in US dollars. The U.S. dollar market is tends to be cheaper and you know more liquid and so on. So a lot of com companies have chosen that route. But the problem is, when the U.S. dollar goes up against the value of your currency, the cost of paying that debt back balloons. Um, it was great when the dollar was falling, but if you haven't noticed, the dollar is not falling anymore. It's rising pretty sharply. So you have a situation where a lot of these companies have borrowed in dollars. And the, every tick up in the dollar index means their, their cost of borrowing or paying that back is going up. So that's where we, that's you know why I call this the everything bubble. That's many ways that it's uh, impacted different markets. But you know, to quote from Bob Dylan, I I do think the times really are changing here. For starters, earlier I showed those balance sheet charts of what's going on uh, you know on the global central bank scale. Well, believe it or not, the Fed is actually now shrinking its balance sheet. Um, this chart goes back to mid 2014. You can see the big run up in, in Fed assets uh, as a result of the tail end of QE3. And you can see that number topped out around $4.51 trillion and then went sideways for a couple of years. But now, as a result of letting some of these bonds that they had previously bought roll off the Fed balance sheet, those numbers are, are shrinking by tens of billions of dollars. As a matter of fact, we're at about 4.38 now, which not a big drop, you know, a drop in the bucket compared to, or when you consider we went from 800 billion to four and a half trillion, but it's the trend change that's important. And we are seeing that flow of Fed money start to dry up a little bit. One thing that's not as widely recognized, but I think is, is you know, especially as I, I watched some of the, the reporting, the TV reporting on the bank's most recent earnings, and I kept shaking my head because nobody was really getting it. <laughs> and that's that the numbers show, if you pay enough attention, that the credit cycle is starting to turn. And what does that mean? Well, we had, you know, obviously on this chart, this shows just one indicator of credit quality, credit card charge-offs. How many, you know, people aren't paying their credit cards, the bank has to write off that bad debt. It's pretty easy to see what happened in the Great uh, Recession. We had that huge swing or that huge surge. And then for many, many quarters, uh, credit quality improved as the economy improved and you know, some of those bad debts were written off and replaced by lending to better quality borrowers. But again, starting in, you know, 2016 timeframe, towards the tail end of the year, we've seen those charge-offs begin to rise again. They're nowhere near those incredibly alarming rates that we saw in the great financial crisis, but they are turning. This is an indicator of the credit cycle be beginning to turn and more people having trouble paying their debts back. 
Um, that was credit cards previously. This is a different sort of scaled chart that comes from the, from the New York Fed itself, actually. It looks at what's happening in auto lending. Um, if you were at the Orlando Money Show or some of the sh stuff I did, the shows I did last year, I was very uh, <laughs> critical of some of the, the stupid auto lending that's going on. I mean, lending for extremely long terms, extremely high loan to value ratios. I found one credit union that was willing to go 140% LTV on a car loan. Uh, I mean, that kind of ridiculousness. And what we've seen is that, uh, that performance of those auto loans, as you might expect, are, is starting to really deteriorate. These different colored lines reflect different uh, credit score tranches. The light blue is subprime under 620. And you can see on the left, the auto finance delinquency rate, 90 days, not just you miss one payment, you know, you're not you're 90 days or a whole quarter behind. That rate is up to around 10%, which is almost as high as we saw in the middle of the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression. And that's arguably happening when we're told on TV every day that the unemployment rate is low and the economy is growing. So how the heck are this many people defaulting? And that tells you a lot about the quality of these loans. Moreover, you can see that even in the higher credit quality lending buckets, there's still an upward trend. It's obviously for, for, or for clear reasons, it's not as bad as subprime. But you can see the auto lending or auto loan performance is now deteriorating as well. Finally, this chart looks at uh, mortgage performance. Um, you know, at the peak of the, the great financial crisis, all this mortgage debt you know, was foreclosed, a lot was written off to zero and so on. Um, and then what happened is the banks uh, once bitten were twice shy. They hardly lended to, lent money to anybody unless they had very high credit quality uh, or high credit scores, lots of money in the bank, low debt to income ratios and so on. So mortgage performance, when you threw in the fact that house prices rebounded, the economy rebounded, and lenders weren't giving money to anybody unless they didn't need it in the first place, uh, you saw a big improvement in mortgage performance. But even there, if you look at the far right scale, this goes through the end of 2017, you're seeing that start to tick up again. It's, it's not huge, it's not anywhere near as bad as we saw you know, 10 years ago, but it's the trend that's important. It's that turn in the credit cycle which drives so much uh, performance in the market, in particular, uh, or the economy even, in particular financial stocks, that's important. So that gives you a little idea of what's going on in credit. Um, what else am I seeing, particularly in the interest rate markets? I mean, that's been my special area of focus for a number of years. Um, and I start out with the, the simple or one of the, the things that gets talked a lot, a lot on the news, and that's the yield curve. I mean, the difference between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. Um, this happens to be the difference between the yield on the 30-year bond and the yield on the five-year note. Um, but you can see basically it's been collapsing. It hit its highs ba back in 2010, was fairly stable for a number of years, but now on the far right, we're really falling off the table. And as of this chart, which was made um, a couple of weeks ago, we were at 36 basis points on this, this uh, spread. Now, that was the lowest since, I drew that white line to kind of show back, that was the lowest since late 2007, which if you remember your market history was right around when the last bull market topped out. So the yield curve is flattening. Um, it's not just 30s to 5s, it's also 2s to 10s, 10s to 30s. Pretty much every measure of the yield curve um, has been flattening, and that's because the Fed is raising short-term interest rates, but there's more concern creeping into the market about long-term growth. So investors aren't as willing to you know, drive long-term bond yields up as much as they're driving up short-term ones. Now, there's some other indicators of, the, of you know, credit trouble. I talked earlier sort of crisis indicators and uh, you know, what I'm seeing out there. Well, this, this chart here shows something called the LIBOR OIS spread. Now, you know, it is later in the day, so I don't want to put anybody to sleep here, but it's the difference between the London Interbank offered rate and the overnight indexed swap rate. It's a, it's a bunch of jargon, but it basically shows you the difference between a rate on a government back, a, a rate tied to government yields versus a rate that's tied to private party, uh, private party swappers, basically. So one is a risk-free rate and one is a rate that uh, looks at what's going on in the lending market. And when banks or other players in that market get more nervous about lending to each other, one goes wider while the, the, um, the underlying government risk-free rate does not. So it's a st credit stress indicator. Since I made this chart, it has come down a little bit on the far right, or that's not shown, but it has come down a little bit, but nowhere near as much as it rose. And this is an indicator of, again, more stress in, in the, uh, the banking and lending system. The TED spread is another one of these, um, another one of these spreads that also is kind of telling the same story. Uh, it's an indicator of behind the scenes credit stress that measures the difference between the yield on the three month treasury bill and three month LIBOR in US dollars. Now, in the old days, it was uh, euro dollars that sort of accounted for the second half of the spread. So that's why it's called the TED spread T for treasury, ED for euro dollars. But in any event, you can see 
we've had a pretty sharp rise in this uh, in the last couple of weeks to the point that we're basically right around the peaks we set when all the oil companies were going bankrupt or, or defaulting on their debt. We've taken out the highs that were from way back and when you had um, some of the other things like the U.S. debt default and so on. Uh, we're nowhere near, I mean, this peak way up here is from the, the tail end of the great financial crisis. We're nowhere near that, but it's the direction and the change in trend that's important. And clearly, this is another one of those indicators that in the background is saying there's something else going on here. And again, that's looking at interest rate spreads. You all know and you all see in the news that interest rate levels are also rising fast. I happen to, for this chart's purposes, show the five-year Treasury note yield um, in a couple of, of key levels, technically speaking. And you can see we're at the, the, the high end of that when I made this chart. We were at about 2.83%. And then yesterday, we had another sharp spike in interest rates. So we actually are even a little bit higher than that. But you have to go all the way back to 2009 to find a higher five-year note yield. Um, and that, again, that's another thing that is putting, it's a different environment that we had. The rising interest rates are slowly becoming more competitive with stocks, the dividend yield on stocks, and uh, also putting pressure on valuations. Now this chart shows the DXY, the dollar index that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, since the, the tail end of the, of the post-election period, um, this the, down, the dollar had been in a downtrend from about December 2016 through about April of this year. But we've started to see a, a reversal in that trend and a pretty interesting one from my standpoint. We took out the, the downtrend, we took out the 200 day moving average, we're moving pretty quickly and now we're even a little bit above the top end of this range. I didn't keep going further back, but you'd see if, if I did that this is sort of a, a range of consolidation that we're potentially breaking out of here. Um, and why is that important? It goes back to that borrowing in U.S. dollars. Um, you know, you see uh, Argentina, Turkey, um, some of these other countries, emerging market nations that have a, a heavy debt load have been borrowing in U.S. dollars, and now their currencies are falling, their stocks are falling, their bonds are falling, and that's uh, another sign of that sort of credit stress that is going on behind the scenes. And it's worth noting um, that you know that similar process with a different batch of emerging market countries is what set out set off the long-term capital management meltdown in 1997-1998. They started with the Thai bot and then ended up you know going throughout Asia and even hitting Russia. And the Dow eventually washed up on our shores, and the Dow lost 20% of its value in six weeks. So um, what happens over there doesn't tend to stay over there. Um, it just there tends to be a lag. So it's something that I'm definitely keeping a close eye on. Now, a few people had asked earlier, you know, what exactly it is that Weiss Ratings does and, and, you know, how I can use the data that we produce. Well, I mean, everybody has an opinion about the markets. I mean, I have mine. Um, you probably have yours, and we're not always going to agree, and that's fine. But one thing that I like about having access to the, the vast database that we have at Weiss Ratings is that I can look at what the numbers are showing and whether they confirm or sort of challenge any thesis that I have for the market. One thing that I'll track is the simple buy-sell ratio of our coverage universe. Um, at Weiss Ratings, we rate about, uh, at last check, about 9,300 U.S. and Canadian stocks, about 1,900 ETFs, and when you include all different share classes of the same mutual funds, about 28,000 mutual funds each and every day we run the model. Uh, and what I like to do is compare the number of stocks that qualify as buys versus the number of stocks that end up in the sell range, and then look at how that ratio uh, has changed over time. So what you can see here, I, I have two different time scales. The one on the left is the short-term ratio. And you can see that it actually peaked um, back in the summer of last year and made a lower high in January of 2018 when the stock market made a higher high. And uh, along with the, or in the recent weeks since then, it's been deteriorating. Um, Long-term, I, I included that, that same chart going back all the way to 2006 to kind of give you an idea of, of obviously what happened when we fell off the table into the Great Recession and so on and the big rebound. But you can see the same thing. It's you know kind of made a lower high uh, and has been rolling over again. So what I think that that reflects is that there's more going on behind the scenes. I mean, it's the Fang stocks. It's this handful of, of very large, almost you know you see the countdown on CNBC for when is Apple going to hit a trillion dollar market cap. You've got a few of these very large uh, mega cap tech stops, tech stocks that are helping to hold up the broader averages while you're seeing deterioration behind the scenes. So that's one of those things that you know from a data standpoint makes me a little more concerned as well. Um, you know, the, unless it happened in the last couple of days, I saw him talking about it last week, but I think this week it might have been this week. So, 
you know, you add it all up, and I kind of feel like this is one of those markets. Um, you know, if you talked to me 12 to 18 months ago, I, I would have a lot more bullish ideas. I'd, I'd have a lot more constructive thoughts on the market. Um, but I think that the conditions really are changing. So, you know, in honor of, uh, of Ulysses here, we've got him strapped to the uh, the proverbial mast and trying to resist that siren song. I think that that's sort of, as an investor, that's one of those things that you need to be uh, looking to do in your own portfolio. And That'll bring me back to the mistakes that I talked about earlier. Um, again, expecting QE forever. You know, the old reality, the sort of pre-January 18, you know, Bernanke and then Yellen and the Fed working hand in glove with fiscal authorities and the Obama administration. That you know, the general idea was to ensure this the steady advance in the market to juice the wealth effect. I mean, Ben Bernanke wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, basically admitting that that's what they wanted to do. Uh, and foreign central banks were were playing along in unison. It was sort of a you know all of us to, in the pool together type environment. But the new reality, I think Powell is, is a different kind of Fed uh, chair, chairman. Um, I think he's not as market friendly as we've grown used to over the past years with Bernanke and Yellen. Uh, we've seen some repeated warnings about asset valuations, corporate borrowing, commercial real estate. And it's not just coming from Powell. We've seen it even from, from some doves like um, um, Leonard Braille. Um, excuse me. I'm messing her name up, but you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> so. I'll add it all up, and I think the strike price of the Fed put, so to speak, um, how much uh, chaos the Fed would need to say before changing tax, is a lot lower than people appreciate. Um, and at the same time, the global central bank paths are diverging, so that's important. And Lyle Brainerd is the one I'm thinking of. On the, the, the tech obsession, I mean, I get it. There's a lot of good things happening in, in terms of technology and what it does for our lives. But I truly think when I see the media coverage and what's been going on, like, I mean, this breathless hype, robots are taking over the world and artificial intelligence and your car is going to drive itself and putting things in the cloud is going to save the world. And, and, you know, Netflix just bought another content producer for $5 billion. So that's going to be great for them, even though they borrowed the money. I mean, it really has gotten to the point of ridiculousness. Um, but in, in the environment we had for quite some time, that was all that drove the market. It was basically fang stocks. And, you know, you could almost ignore what was going on in other parts of the market. But, you know, you know, we have had a little bit of a rebound, obviously, in the last few days. But you know, heading after in the post-January period, we've seen deterioration and a lot more volatility in steels, industrials, uh, financials. Are, aren't, are you know, the XLF is a buck and a half below its high, even though the Russell is trying to make a new high here. Uh, housing, uh, housing ETFs and housing stocks are falling. Transports have been weaker than the averages. Uh, autos, you know, out, outside of all the hype about Tesla, the other auto companies aren't performing well. So. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in other sectors that don't grab the media attention, but it certainly is not, you know, an all in the pool. We're all pulling higher uh, together. And even you know, all the earnings news we had, whether it's good news from the FANG companies or the banks in particular, um, a lot of that good news has been sold into. So I think you've got that going on. You've got some rotation going on into some safer sectors, uh, utilities, REITs, and so on. So it's, it's, again, that's an example of. If you're stuck thinking how you were thinking in the last few years, um, that's not the kind of market we're going to have going forward. And again, th this idea of sideshow markets versus the main event, I mean, when when there wasn't a change or there weren't changes going on in some of these peripheral markets, currencies and credit and so on, you could focus on, you know, I, I don't mean to be too derogatory by calling them sideshow markets, but Bitcoin's going to take over the world. And if it doesn't, then it's going to be Canada stocks. And if it's not that, you know, insert whatever the latest fad is. You know, nobody needed to care. I mean, who the heck cares about LIBOR? Uh, these are these stories are sexier and more interesting. But um, you know, they do have their purpose and their point in investor portfolios. But what I see going on in, in all these other places, the yield curve, the rise in the dollar, the the, the, the spreads that are blowing out, um, some of these other indicators, that was what really told you that something bad was coming our way back in the mid 2000s. And uh, you know, you're getting these more of these warning signs today that I think people need to pay attention to. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Um, and finally, I think, you know, the getting blinded by politics. I mean, I'm a pretty apolitical guy. I'm a market guy. That's what I, I focus on mostly. But, you know, we had we were in this environment where with everything, correlations pretty tight and index fund investing, you know, being popular, you can almost have a set set it and forget it strategy when it came to investing. You buy index funds and you spend your time arguing about, you know, the latest thing Donald Trump said. You know, some people say he stinks, no, he's great, he just tweeted this, he fired them, he hired you know, it was it, a lot of blah blah going on that I think when you didn't have to pay attention to the other stuff, that's what got, gets all the media attention. But it makes for great TV, but it isn't what's driving the markets. And I don't think it's going to be what's driving the markets going forward. I mean, it's the economic and financial type things. Uh, it's the credit and currency developments and so on that are really signaling this is a different environment and that you need to take different steps and invest differently. Um, 
So if I try and sort of tie it all up since I've got about 10 minutes left, um, what's the bottom line? Again, if you're familiar with our company, then you know we're not shy about uh, shouting from the rooftops, proverbially speaking, if, if you need to get out. Um, I joined the company in 2001, but you know Martin Weiss back in late 1990s uh, was very uh, vocally bearish on what's going on in tech and, and warning of disaster there. We, our model actually had 99 plus percent of stocks rated, NASDAQ stocks rated sell right before the crash. Um, me personally, you know, again, I came on in 01. I had a lot to say in, in the mid 2000s about what was going on in housing and mortgages, and you know, that was when we were all being told things would be contained, and I said that was a bunch of bunk, um, and we had a real problem. So I think that now a lot of the the if the last couple of times we had very acute bubbles that were very serious in a small uh, range of stocks and, and market sectors and so on. Now we have not necessarily as acute, but a much broader situation where, where it's assets of all shapes, all sizes that have been artificially inflated. Um, and it really then raises the question of what happens when this thing starts to pop. And I think the volatility that we saw in January, February, um, the decline in the Fed's balance sheet, the rise in interest rates, uh, what's happening in these spreads indicates that some of these, these in, you know, we're starting to reach that turning point now. There's, there's technical confirmation of it. There's fundamental developments that are different from anything we've had in the last nine years. So that's why I think we're pretty near the, uh, the point where this, this thing's on its last legs. Um, this is actually the safe money report that we published back in June of 2005. I still have this one in a drawer um, because it did say, you know, it's the final stage of the real estate bubble. And that was pretty much the month that things began to top out. And we had a lot to say about what to do. So bottom line, um, I think if you're invested in stocks, uh, you really do need to think about cutting your overall exposure. Um, you know, what everybody does, what's appropriate for them, I can't tell you. Um, but I personally just slashed my 401k stock allocation to the lowest it's been in, in probably more than a decade. Um, I've, you know, in the publications that I manage, I've reallocated to safer, higher uh, rated stocks, um, things that had fallen out of favor, like utilities, a few select REITs. Um, the cash portfolio allocations and things like the safe money report, it had been about zero for many, many months. It, you know, I've progressively raised it up to about 40% now. Um, I've started using, and I think that as an investor, you need to start considering hedges, things like inverse ETFs that have been very, you know, have would have dragged down your performance during this raging bull market um, need to be looked at again. And I think uh, put options as well, if you're comfortable trading and using options, um, I think there, this is the time to be looking to hedge risk and, and maybe even, you know, as the market unfolds, if we get more confirmation, start looking for uh, downside profits again. Things like financials, I harp on that a lot because even if you look at the top of the last bull market, um, financials peaked a few months before uh, the broader averages did. And in the rebound that we had into 2007, if memory serves, financials did not make a, a higher high along with the Dow. And it was one of those things that we're telling you that this credit stuff is really starting to matter. Um, so I think that's something we need to pay attention to. And, and I also think, um, you know, this this overvaluation and this overfocus on tech is going to be a problem going forward as well. So um, those are some concrete steps you can take. Uh, if you do want more information and, and ongoing picks, um, we had called it the High Yield Investing Newsletter that I'm the, the editor of. We did uh, get the rights back and renamed it uh, the Safe Money Report just this month. I think it's appropriate given the focus that we're going to have going forward. Uh, a little more focus on safety, less yield chasing, and so on. Um, so that's one thing that we do have the, the deal for the uh, Las Vegas Money Show, $78 a year, and the phone number's on the screen or on the flyers that you have there. If you're interested, all you do is call and ask for that discount, and they'll take care of you. Um, Supercycle Investor is a more aggressive, more frequent, um, active trading service that a, a colleague of mine, Sean Broderick, is in charge of. It's another thing that we offer for investors who are looking for that kind of, uh, again, more aggressive type investing that is less a monthly long-term money type publication and more focused on a trading, active trading environment. Um, you know, Sean agrees with a lot of things that I see. He has a lot of uh, additional knowledge in sectors like precious metals and, um, you know, base and, and base metals as well and, and energy and so on. So that's something that he likes to focus on. And his is obviously more expensive at 1994 a year, but that is discounted from the normal price. And if uh, you know you want to, if you're not interested in either of those things, you want to at least start by getting an idea for what we do. I would encourage you to go to the WeissRatings.com website. Um, you can sign up to get our daily briefing three times, or not, I shouldn't call it daily briefing. It's three times a week in the morning. Um, that does give an overview of what's going on in the markets and, and kind of points and talks about some of these developments. Uh, there, it's absolutely free. 
And depending on what level, if you want the free membership or if you do want to step up to our platinum service on the rating site, you can get the, the uh, letter grades of all the stocks and funds and so on that we follow. You can get notified when they change. You can do all kinds of things with screeners, um, you know, ask for a universe of stocks that meet all of your criteria and drill down from 9,300 to maybe five or 10 stocks you want for your portfolio. So something to keep in mind. And just, you know, before I jump to questions, I would just say, you know, it's important that we understand, and to me, that this isn't the same market environment we had from 2009 to what I would say January 2018. Um, if you continue to invest like we uh, have been sort of taught over the last several years through experience, I think you're going to end up being like the guy who, you know, put his uh, truck in first instead of the boat. <laughs> And uh, it's not going to work for you going forward. And, and I would say, arguably, people who do that will be doing it wrong. So with that, uh, my, my handy clock tells me i got a few minutes left. So uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure. Well, I think with the charts, and the gentleman, if anybody couldn't hear, was asking about the scale. Some charts look like it's really, oh my gosh, you're right on the edge of a cliff, whereas others say, okay, we've got a problem, but maybe it's not going to be an issue for a while. Um, valuation it can be a lousy timing tool. It tells you there's a problem. It tells you valuations are excessive, but it doesn't necessarily tell you when that's going to matter. So I've been watching this trend build and getting more alarmed about it, but what's changed for me in terms of the timing of it is, again, that sort of blow-off high we had in January, followed by this big, you know, uh, VIX explosion, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, the canary in the coal mine, when you look at some of these VIX ETFs that lose 90% of their value overnight, uh, the market had bounced bounced back from that, but the bounce had less vigor to it. Um, you're seeing underperformance in a few things that you would tend to be maybe an early warning sign like financials. So I think, you know, I'm not in a sort of sell everything mode yet, but if I look at the couple of things that are left in the portfolio, they're very isolated stories, the individual companies, I mean, um, that have a, a specific story, have some yield support, are very highly rated on our scale, which goes from A to, a to E. Um, I think that you know, I would be extremely surprised if this bull market goes for another year, maybe at most a few months. I do think that, and, and that's why, you know, it doesn't have to be an instant collapse, but I do think that we're pretty darn close to a turning point because I'm seeing technical confirmation that says, hey, these things that have been building up and building up, uh, you know, are really co close to boiling over. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, because because he, he he has been. But uh, what I'm what I'm asking is, there uh, have there been any times when uh, you've been very bullish and you have promoted uh, bullish? Uh, sure. Uh, um, if you look at the presentations I've given over the last five or six years, most of them talked about some of the risks, but were pretty much uh, arguably constructive in terms of what to invest in. I remember we, we published in partnership with a German firm, a German version of Safe Money, and I actually was told I was too bullish because their crowd was was more uh, was more bearish than ours. The, the uh, High Yield Investing Now Safe Money Report portfolio was basically 100% invested last year. Uh, I made 37% on Texas Instruments in six months. Uh, we had H&E equipment services that we made 42% in six weeks on. Um, we had things like Travelers, 3M. Uh, so this is not the kind of portfolio that was constructed by a perma bear, um, you know, a year ago. And that's been the case, in my opinion, you know, for some time. I've been pretty, again, I was cautious heading into the election. And I thought, you know, regardless of my personal feelings or beliefs about Donald Trump, I thought that I called it the Trump quake. And I got extremely bullish from a market standpoint uh, after that event. And that paid off. Um, so, you know, I can't speak to, I mean, we've certainly been bearish at times when we should have been bullish, and vice, you know, in the past, but I think that what I'm trying to communicate now is deliberate and different, um, and my positioning, if you looked at the newsletter from last May versus now, would show that, you know, proverbially putting the money where the mouth is, so, so to speak. So, yeah, oh, oh. you said that uh, you're not in the uh, sell everything mode yet. Correct. What would be your asset allocation at this point? Uh, stock, bonds? Sure. Well, the safe money, um, let me see. Actually, I believe I have it. Hold on. Safe money um, portfolio right now, 
Let's see if I can call it up. I did have it on my desktop here. I don't mind sharing while we're here. Um, just to briefly give you an idea. Yep. Nah, I'm just going to take a little while to find. Um, as I mentioned, last year we were, about, we were essentially 100% invested. Um, right now it's about 40% in cash. Um, there is uh, one ETF that, that I bought uh, into some of this credit turmoil that is an income ETF. It's a higher income ETF that's more of a trade versus a long-term investment. So that's 5%. Um, and the remaining stocks, uh, it's again, we have a company called Mercer International, which is actually here at the show. They had a presentation. There are Timberlands uh, or wood products, pulp, that kind of thing. Nice yield, highly rated. That's done well for us. Um, Core Energy Infrastructure Trust. It's an it's a, uh, energy transport storage uh, company. So those and it's yield support. Um, and then you know a few a few other names uh, extra storage uh, extra space storage it's a storage REIT those are the kinds of things that again have yield support and I like the store self storage part of the uh, the REIT industry because unlike uh, companies like office REITs or retail REITs they don't get hammered as much in a downturn people are still moving and mobile and need to store their junk even if there's a recession so that's the kind of stuff that is still in there and recommendations are still in there but. Like I mentioned, um, the portfolio is about 40% cash versus zero. And like I mentioned, my 401k thing, I mean, you know, I don't mind saying I'm at about 35% stable value cash in there, whereas I was 5 or 10% a year ago. So are you 60% in uh, equities? No, it would be the re again, there's a cash component. I mean, there. when I say we're in the 40% cash, it's actually a short-term uh, bond ETF, so SHV, so um, you know, one year or less. So there's that. There's probably about 10% of pure, like uninvested in anything cash. And then that uh, bond ETF is about 5% and the rest is equity. So let's call it around, you know, 50-ish percent. Thank you. Yep. Uh, was there anything else? I know you had a follow-up, so if there's nobody else, no? Uh, over the last decade? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, no, I guess I couldn't. I mean, I don't have anything in my, my PowerPoint slide, but like you're, right after the Trump election we published last year, I did three special reports on defense, on infrastructure and engineering, and on financials. And the financial one was actually called Top 25 Financial Stocks to Buy After the Trump Election. Um, so we had our highest rated ones there. The defense sector and aerospace, I was extremely bullish on. That portfolio was up about 20% last year. So yeah, I mean, those those were the areas that I was bullish on um, in the last year. But going back five, six, seven years, um, I mean, it's varied. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're at the point now where I've seen enough that I want to be at that 40 to 50% range. Um, and I should also mention in that portfolio, there is also SKF as a hedge. So that's another 5%. I actually just raised that to 10%. Um, and one of the other positions that is a non-stock is uh, EUO, the, the uh, uh, ProShare Ultra Short Euro ETF. So um, you factor those in, and I mean, the, the stock pure stock percentage is even lower. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it could get to the point where I would basically say if we break those lows that we had in that, that sort of time frame in, um, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, late uh, March or early April, if we break those lows um, in the broader averages. Yeah, but, you know, everybody focuses on just that line. And, you know, there, and then that, we had that one day, what, where we flushed and we went down like 400 points and then rallied. And, and that was, you know, it's not just the 200 day. It's more also what's happening on a sector basis behind the scenes. So I wouldn't just say if... You know, I wouldn't have like one variable say if we close behind you know, a low 200 day sell everything, it's going to be more nuanced. But that is one of the things that would factor into it. What's that? I'm certainly not as famous as that guy is now. I, I'd like to say that I mean the work we did on housing and that I, you know the, the stuff that I that I did and said I mean you know was probably as aggressive as what that guy was saying. I mean you know I, CNBC brought a satellite truck to the house once and did a, a sit down when a housing starts report came out because they sort of thought of me as the bear or one of the bears they could reach into the Rolodex and call on it. So um, you know I think that certainly. Yes, if it you know if it gets to that level, I mean we're gonna do everything we can to get the message out. I mean you know I wouldn't be making the per. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, again, like I said, I mean, uh, SKF is the uh, double short uh, financials ETF. So that's one thing that is now in the portfolio. Um, you know, the, the EUO being the essentially a long dollar, or in this case, double short euro ETF. There are, those are actual steps into the short side, basically, because I think what's driving the dollar up is also negative for the stock market. So, anyway. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate everybody staying till late in the day for this one. Thank you.